you have your Bible, go to the book of Genesis, chapter 11. If you're taking notes, if you're titling a Facebook Live, you can title tonight, When Our Yes Meets Heavens Now. When Our Yes Meets Heavens Now. There's something about the power of yes. And there's something about coming into agreement with heaven. Amen? And I believe that for the most part, we don't fully understand the power of our agreement When we say yes to what heaven is sending to us, come on, when we say yes to heaven's now, I want you to understand that all the earth moves, come on, angelic is released, mountains are shaken, chains are broken, we need to resound our yes to heaven's now. And um, the interesting thing is that Throughout Scripture, we're just going to highlight a few tonight, but throughout Scripture, there is overwhelming evidence of the power of when people come together with a yes, what is possible. Now, we understand through Scripture, at least we understand intellectually tonight, that with God all things are possible. How many would agree with that tonight? How many have an understanding that with God all things are possible? But here's the reality. If it was a truth, if it was a revelatory truth in our heart, we would do more than just have an intellectual understanding that with God all things are are, are possible. We would apply our yes to what heaven is saying, and we would start to move some mountains and shake some kingdoms and change some systems of this earth. Church, I want you to understand tonight that Jesus did not die just so that way some group could meet every weekend and have a kumbaya moment and establish programs for their students and their children could come home with nice little crafts that you hang up on a refrigerator. Jesus died so he could establish his kingdom on the earth so that way disease and death and hell would be conquered forever and ever. To even go a little further, the understanding of our agreement, our understanding of yes, goes on to even how Jesus taught us, how the Word teaches us to end our prayers with the word, amen. Amen means so be it. It means yes and amen. I believe, and now we seal this promise, we seal this prayer with agreement, and we say so be it. Because as we get ready over these next few weeks, to start talking about faith, this is what we need to understand. That inside of your mouth, inside this tongue, lies power. And whether you realize it or not, you are either speaking life or you are speaking death. I choose to prophesy life. I choose to speak life. I choose to prophesy and speak things that are not as though they are. But the key to all of that, the, and we're going to read one of those scriptures here about the binding and the loosing. The key to all that is not hopping on your will and your wants and your needs. But you need to get your yes in alignment with heaven's now. And the moment your yes lines up with heaven's now, all of a sudden heaven stops and says, there's a person who gets it. Heaven, I release every angel that's sitting around the throne right now to accomplish the will of God. He will make sure that his word comes to pass. Our yes needs to align with God's. Now, Now let me show you here in the book of Genesis what happens when people... Unite. When people get their yes together. It's a famous story about a tower named Babel. In this tower, they were building, and everybody thinks it was tall, and that was actually a a, a 
error in the translation of of English, it was actually an astrological worship center. They worshiped the sun, the moon, and the stars. It was the worship of Baal in this place. And as they are building this, you got to remember the whole world is speaking one language. And everybody is coming together united to build this temple to worship a God named Baal. And listen to what the Father says in verse 5. But the Lord came down. And he looked at the city and at the tower the people were building. And he said, look, the people are united. And they all speak the same language. After this, nothing, somebody say nothing. Nothing they set out to do will be impossible. Let's just pause for a moment. They were not doing this in the power of God. They were not doing this to build God's kingdom. Are are you following me? Because they stood united, Father said, nothing they set their minds to do will be impossible. Whatever they can agree on, whatever they can unite upon, it's going to be done. Why? Because you and I were made in the image of the Father. And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all in unity. And the moment that they decided to get all on the same page, which they were always on the same page, but you follow my train of thoughts here, and they said, let's speak the world into existence. What happened? I mean, we know that the Trinity was involved in the whole process. First three verses of Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the face of the deep. And then God said, let there be light. We know that when God speaks, it's Jesus in action. Why? John 1 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And everything that is formed was formed through Him. The Word. So the first three verses shows the Trinity saying, we're going to form this thing called the earth. And we're going to put a people on it made in our image. And one of the dangers of that is if they get together and get their hearts united and put their yes with one another, nothing they do will be stopped. So Father knew that the spread of this worship would go all over the earth and bring harm and devastation and danger. So what did Father do in this moment? He struck them with confusion. And he changed their languages, and they couldn't speak with one another any longer. They could no longer be united. And they scattered and started the peoples of the earth that we now know today. But then, you know, God is in the redeeming business. And though he scattered them with one language in the book of Genesis... When you flip all the way to the book of Acts, chapter 2, even though he scattered them by confusing their language in Genesis, he unites them with a new language in the book of Acts, chapter 2. And it says, in the, in the, well, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. They were in one mind and one accord. Guess what another name for that is? They were in unity. And then suddenly a sound as of a mighty rushing wind filled the room. And tongues of fire, flames of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. God separated humanity because of unity, but now he brings them back together in unity because their hearts are in the right place. No longer are these people interested in building their temples and their kingdoms, but they're interested in building the kingdom of God. What happens when we come together? What happens when there's unity? Well, Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, he says, I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything, say anything, you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. God will do it for you. If you ask anything. Now, I've asked for a lot of silly things in my life. I've even gotten people to agree with me. (laughs) 
And everybody laughing knows exactly what I'm talking about. Praise Jesus. But he says this, for where two or three, because he keeps on saying, my heavenly father will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered there together as my followers, I am among them. Another translation, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. But, but notice what he says here, if two or three gather as my followers. When you're a follower or a disciple of Jesus, you want what Jesus wants. So when you want what Jesus wants, you get what the Father wants. Because Jesus said, I don't want anything of my own accord. Not my will, Father, but your will be done. I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only go where the Father sends me. I only speak as the Father speaks to me. Are you following me? So as we get Jesus' will, we're getting the Father's will. Come on. And now, when we ask, because earlier, look at what he says here uh, just um, uh, yeah, yeah, look at just verse 18. We read 19, but I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Another translation says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But what you have to understand, Matthew chapter 18, he's speaking to a Jewish community, a Jewish culture, and they understand. He's talking about mitzvahs. He's talking about people coming in and echoing the ordinances and the commands of God. He's not telling you you have the right to bind what you want to bind and loose what you want to loose. But the moment you start to bind what the Father wants bound and loose what the Father wants loosed, all of heaven says, I found a yes. And then the Father's heart gets stirred. You see, the Father's plans for us are good. Come on, somebody. So all of a sudden, he finds a people whose yes lines up with his will, lines up with heaven's. Now, how many know that heaven is waiting on a yes? I sought for a man who would stand in the gap on behalf of my people. Now, we know that ultimately that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But God is still looking because Jesus went into the devil's house which he was technically squatting in. You know anything about squatters? You know, does everybody here know what a squatter is? Somebody who, who, who's living in a house that doesn't belong to them. This house was built for you and me. We gave the devil the keys to our house, and we say, here you go, buddy. It's yours. We're going to go take a nap over here while you get to rule and reign and change our paint colors and put holes in our furniture and steal the copper out of the walls. Come on, you follow me. And Jesus is sitting up there being like, he's like, he's a good landlord. You know what I'm saying? And he like, I am sit- that, that house belongs to my children, not this stinking fallen angel. So I'm, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to take back the keys because I'm bringing the deed. And the deed says that this place belongs to me. And according to my will, I'm leaving it to my children. So there's a squatter in the house. So I'm going to come and I'm going to kick that squatter out and give it back to the people whom it belonged to in the first place. So when Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave, he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He took the keys of authority that Adam and Eve handed over to him. He took them back. And then what did Jesus do? I now give you the authority. Whatever you bind shall be bound. Whatever you loose shall be loose. He turned it right back over to the people it belonged to. Heaven is so good that it will not interfere in earthly situations until a person says yes. Now the Holy Spirit is so awesome. How many know that you could be in your room in Olean at 3 o'clock in the morning praying in the spirit, asking for a yes of a situation that's happening all the way across the world that you have no idea about? (laughs) So how many know that your yes doesn't need understanding? It just needs a yes. (laughs) And so if my people who are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray. Then I will hear from everybody is waiting for Jesus to swoop in like Superman 
and rescue Lois Lane, who has the worst luck in the world, who every single day finds herself in the grasp and in the clutches of some evil person. Seriously, if this woman wasn't Clark Kent's love, she would have been dead a long time ago. But the church is waiting somehow for Jesus to split the eastern sky and save us from all our problems. And Jesus is saying, wake up, y'all. I gave you the power to fix all the problems on the earth. The only reason things are going on in the earth the way they are is because God's people have not aligned their yes with heaven's now. And we have allowed the enemy back into our home, access to our kitchen, eating out of our fridge, and using our toilet, and he's not flushing And then we have the audacity to try to rebuke him when we've let him in in the first place. I'm going to take another drink and let you think about that. That'd be like trying to rebuke the electric company for your electric bill. You used it, you pay for it. So what we got to do is stop agreeing with what the enemy has said. I don't care what the doctor's report says. I don't care what your kids have told you. I don't care what your husband and your wife have told you. All I know is no matter what the report is, heaven's now deserves my yes. And so I choose to agree with the word of the Lord. I know it sounds simple and kind of crazy, but I'll never forget my mom and my dad told me, you know, they, they got saved. And when my parents, my dad, let me back this up. My, my, my parents were worldlians. It's a word now. Like, they knew how to party and live it up. And, you know, they were, my, my father was making a buttload of money in the 70s. I mean, they had three houses all across the country. I mean, my father was a buyer for a company called Maze. And, I mean, they flew them all over the world. Okay, my, my family was so wealthy. My mom didn't get her driver's license until she was in her 40s because we were always driven places by chauffeurs. We had a seven living staff. We had nannies, chefs, all, all cleaners. They lived in our house in the, in the servant's wing. I wasn't born yet. Yeah, I, I was born when they were living off of welfare, just saying. God's honest truth. So um, my, this is how my, my parents did clothes shopping. Models would come to my parents' house, model that season's clothing. They would pick out what they liked. Then it would be tailor fit to them and delivered to their front door. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And all throughout that, my father was part of a cult called the Santa Morismo. And in that cult, which is like a mixture of Catholicism and voodoo, my father was a high priest. He was called the head of the table. And he used to raise up dead people and cast spells and curse or bless, all that junk. And he was wealthy. And one day, he hurt his back, went for a back operation. The surgeon nicked his spine, paralyzed him waist down, never to walk again. In a wheelchair. And this is before workers' comp. This is before all that. And all of that money and all those homes and all those cars went to paying medical bills. And they literally went from that high rollers lifestyle to welfare within years. And my father one day while watching Jimmy Swagger on TV. Jimmy Swagger gave a salvation call. And my father accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior right there in that living room. No one around to witness it. No one, no, 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 no show, no nothing. He was just there in a wheelchair. And then Jimmy Swagger had a word of knowledge. So there's a man right now watching this who's in a wheelchair. God said, if you stretch out your hand, touch the TV right now, you'll be healed. My father stretched out his hand, got out of that wheelchair instantly. <laughs> While this is going on, my brother Bob and my brother Dave were running one of the largest drug, r- drug rings on Long Island. The last I heard, my brother Dave said they were going through eighty-five to $90,000 of cocaine a day. 
It's back in the 70s, y'all. The problem was they started using more than they were selling. And it started to change their lifestyle. My brother Bob married the daughter of the king of the Latin kings, one of the biggest Hispanic gangs at the time throughout the metropolitan New York area. And Bob kind of got out of the business. He got saved. God radically changed his heart instantly from a 12-year crack addiction, instantly just redeemed him. Completely, no, no, what do you call it, withdrawal, no nothing, just saved, clean, done, over. But what he did was he decided to cut my brother Dave, he decided to cut him off because he wanted his brother saved. So my brother to save uh, did what any other good crack addict would do, started robbing banks. Yeah, he robbed eight banks or seven banks at gunpoint. He actually shot off his firearm in one of them. He robbed the same bank twice. He was known regionally as the fishnet bandit because he would wear fishnet stockings when he robbed the banks. This is my brother Dave, the guy who comes and does the, the Seder meals, that guy. telling you this is going somewhere with this is lining up with what I'm preaching he starts having a dream seven nights in a row that he's being chased by the police he doesn't know what to think he says okay God if you're real you need to take this from me because I can't stop he's working at a robotics company on Long Island called Anorad goes out to his car for his lunch break lights up a joint as he lights it all of a sudden all he hears is sirens Police from Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, troopers, state police, uh, everybody surround helicopters. They're like a scene out of a movie, you know, when the cars come speeding, and the cops get out in the full swag, surrounding him. Come out with your hands up. Gets arrested. He's in a holding cell, 10 by 10. There's like 200 men shoved in this 10 by 10 cell. And he's sitting there and he's praying. You would do it too. The guy standing next to him says, oh, you're saved? My brother said, yeah, 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 I'm saved. Me too. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. He goes, you feel with the Holy Spirit? My brother's like, I have no idea what that is. Well, let's pray. Let's receive it. In the holding pen. Next thing you know, my brother and this guy speaking in tongues. The 198 other men are shoved all the way in the corner. As my brother and this guy are speaking in tongues, he gets filled with the joy of the Holy Ghost, can't stop smiling, goes before the judge. The judge thinks he's making a mockery of the court, gives him a $2 million bail, still the highest bail ever set on Long Island. Supposed to serve seven years to life for each armed robbery sentence, while up serving six years in prison. While he was in prison, started one of the largest prison ministries in the nation at the time. Hundreds and hundreds of men gave their life to Jesus through what happened in that prison cell. We were sitting one year at Thanksgiving talking about all these stories, reminiscing of the days. And we said, Mom, Dad, what do you think it was? She said, every night, Olga, Maxie, my, Olga's my sister. I have a sister, just in case you didn't know. Max, my brother Max, I was too young. I was like two years old, three years old at the time. And your father and me would kneel at the bed Say, Father, save our boys. Save our boys. They might be the largest crack dealers on Long Island, but save them, God. My son might be robbing the banks, but save him. And God chased them down to the deepest, darkest pits of hell and pulled them out of the miry clay. Said, no, son, I have a greater purpose. I have a greater destiny for you. This is beneath you. I did not go to the cross so you would die as a crack addict. There's so much more that I have for you. God's heavens now lined up with my parents, yes. And because of that, let me tell you something. Because of what God did in my father's life and because of what God did in my brother's life, Every single family member on my mother and my father's side are now saved, serving the Lord, or in ministry. When your yes lines up with heaven's now, everything changes. 
I don't care how bad the situation looks. All you need to say is, yes, God, I believe. I believe. For all things are possible for those who... We were thinking about it when my father passed away. We are sitting, talking, reminiscing. Think about the legacy that he was able to shift with one yes. With one yes, he changed generations to come. One man's yes gave you your pastor. He gave Gina her husband. What can you do with your yes? You don't need to be behind a pulpit or have your name on a billboard or or have a multi-million dollar ministry for your yes to be impactful. Man, nobody ever needs to even hear your yes except for God. And it can literally shift everything as you know it. Let me close it with one more man's yes. It's a story. It's not in the Bible, but it happened. It is in the Bible, but not the way I'm about to tell it. This is the, the MSV, the Michael Slane's version. So uh, it's coming out next month. Not joking, lying. So there were these people who were loved by their Creator. But they didn't love him in return quite the same way. And they chose to follow the passions of their flesh and the desires of their eyes and all these lusts and things. Instead of loving the one who formed them and gave them their life and all the blessings that they saw. Instead of honoring and loving him, they decided to honor and love themselves. And the creator would have been justified in saying, you know what y'all, forget you. I'm going to go to Jupiter and start a new group. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to eradicate this whole solar system, start, so, start fresh somewhere else. Isn't that what most of us do? When something doesn't work, let's just scratch the whole thing, start all over. But what happened is this creator, this father, loved us so much. He said, man, i got to do something to, number one, break the power and the bondage that their actions have put them in called sin. And I have to demonstrate that love through some great example because it's that demonstration is through my kindness that will lead them to understanding that they need a Savior. It will lead them to repent. It will lead them to salvation. And here's the son just chilling because he really didn't do a whole lot in the Old Testament. I mean, he showed up to a few people as the angel of the Lord. Here he is just relaxing, going through the DVR. And he said, Father, did you say you needed somebody? And the father said, yes, son, I need somebody who is willing to live a perfect, sinless life, even though you will be tempted in the same manner and likeness as every single person down there. He will face every temptation, every desire, every thought that every single person has, who's in this room that has ever crossed their mind, yet it went through Jesus' too. And let's just think about that for a second. Every temptation Jesus faced, yet he did not fall into the temptation. So what's our excuse? Anyway, so he said, okay, give me some more details. So you're going to have to face temptation. You're going to have to live perfectly. You're going to have to honor the law. You're going to have to fulfill the law. But here's the kicker, son. At the end of this perfect, sinless life where you hurt nobody, you abuse nobody, you gossiped about nobody, you, they're going to, instead of putting you on a throne where you deserve, they're going to hang you on a tree. And instead of putting a crown of gold on your head like you deserve, they're going to shove a crown of thorns on you. Instead of kissing your hand, they're going to beat your face. And the son thought about it. And he said, you know what? Yeah. Send me. You see, the Bible doesn't say for Jesus so loved the world. For God. And the word God there in the Greek is the Father. Jesus came not on his own love for you. He came on the fact that the Father loved you. And he was willing to be heaven's yes. 
Because the father had a need, and he knew that only a man could answer heaven's now with a yes. So Jesus said, send me. I'll become a man, and I'll be your yes. And here we are 2,000 years later, and every single person in this room is a product of Jesus' yes. What would have happened if Jesus said, you know what, Father? Us three, we're good enough. I mean, we don't really need anybody else. I mean, we got angels 24 hours a day adorning us with praise. Do we really want to hear people's complaints? Don't you understand, Father, that these people are going to take this gospel and this message of what I've done and manipulate it for money and power and control? Don't you understand, Father, they're going to take some of the truth and twist it and come up with all sorts of cults and false religions and do all sorts of evil things in the name of God? Isn't it better that we just leave them to themselves and let them pay the penalty that they rightly deserve? Aren't you thankful Jesus didn't say that? Aren't you thankful Jesus answered the Father with a three-letter word? Yes! So what are you going to say yes to tonight? What's heaven's now over your life? And think about this, y'all. In the flesh, in the natural, Jesus didn't even get to see the rewards of his yes. I mean, he, he gets to see them, but from a heavenly perspective. Maybe one of the reasons we don't say yes is because it's not our yes with heaven's now. We want heaven's yes for our now. And there's a difference. See, heaven doesn't have to agree with our now. We got to agree with heaven's now. And what if heaven's now for you is just sow the seed? What if heaven's now for you is water the seed? What if heaven's yes for you is lose your life? Because in the end, you'll gain it. Remember the story about the Coptic Christians that Robert Learden told? When they rounded up the 20 Coptic Christians, they rounded up 21 people, not 20. One of those men was not a believer. He was not a Coptic Christian. He was Islamic. And he saw 20 men lose their head because they wouldn't deny the God in who they serve. And when they got to this man, they asked him, who is your God? And he said, whoever they serve. Because if they're willing to die for their God, so am I. He must be the real deal. So, so, so what if that's your, your, your heavens now? Because that man's testimony brought people into the kingdom. So what is heaven saying now over your life that you have to say yes and amen. So be it. So be it, Lord. So, Father, we ask that all attempts to build our little kingdoms would fail. Anything that's still of the flesh in us that still has control or, or power, Father, let it be gone. We don't want the things that we can produce the things that we can do. We don't want heaven's yes for our now. We want, as Jesus taught us, not my will, but your will be done, Father. So we say yes and amen to heaven's now. And when we align ourselves with that, we know that whatever we ask in your name, it shall be done. Whatever we agree upon, it shall be accomplished. Whatever, whatever we set our minds to, even, Father, as you said all the way back in the book of Genesis, nothing will be impossible for them if they stand in unity. So, Father, may our yes resound in the earth and come into agreement with the kingdom of God and see suicide 
leave our nation. See drug addiction, leave our nation. Poverty and sickness, leave our nation. Divorce, leave our nation. Every principality, every power, everything that comes against your kingdom, let our yes resound with heaven's no and see everything that stands against you leave. We are so sick and tired of putting up with it just for the sake of being kind and nice. Father, let there be a fire that rises up in us that our yes would resound with your now and we would see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth now in Jesus name so father we give you all the praise all the glory and all the honor and everyone agree tonight by saying yes and amen come on somebody give the Lord a shout of praise